Biological information, positive genetic entropy. We've been going through the book, Biological Information, New Perspectives, edited by a number of uh, lights of the uh, intelligent design movement and also by Bruce Gordon, who is not uh, an intelligent design advocate. Uh, it's published by World Scientific Publishing in 2013. It's late. It was published, uh, the papers were published originally, or were presented in 2011, and the book was ready in 2012 until Springer Verlag ba backed out. Uh, the book is available on the net for free, uh, all of the contents. Um, looks like that. It has a general introduction, and then it has four sections, information theory and biology, biological information and genetic theory, theoretical molecular biology, and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. Right now, we're in the section on biological information and genetic theory. We are in the chapter entitled Information Loss, Potential for Accelerating Natural Genetic Attenuation of RNA Viruses. Wesley Brewer, Francine Smith, and John Sanford. And uh, contact information is there. The abstract starts out, loss of information is not always bad. In this paper, we investigate the potential for accelerating the genetic de degeneration of RNA viruses as a means for slowing and or containing pandemics. It has previously been shown that RNA viruses are vulnerable to lethal mutagenesis the concept of inducing mutational degeneration in a given pathogen. This has led to the use of le lethal mutagenesis as a clinical treatment for eradicating RNA virus from a given infected patient. The present study uses numerical simulation to explore the c concept of accelerated mutagenesis as a way to enhance natural genetic attenuation of RNA viral strains at the epidemiological level. This concept is potentially relevant to improved management of pandemics and may be applicable in certain instances where eradication of certain diseases is sought. We propose that mutation accumulation is a major factor in the natural attenuation of pathogenic strains of RNA viruses, and that this may contribute to the disappearance of old pathogenic strains and natural cessation of pandemics. We use a numerical simulation program, Mendel's accountant, to support this model and determine the primary factors that can enhance such degeneration. Our experiments suggest that natural genetic attenuation can be greatly enhanced by implementing three practices. One, strategic use of antiviral pharmaceuticals that increase RNA mutagenesis. Two, improved hygiene to reduce inoculum levels and hence increase genetic bottlenecking. And three, strategic use of broad spectrum vaccines that induce partial immunity. In combination, these three practices should profoundly accelerate loss of biological information, attenuation, in RNA viruses. The introduction starts out, the concept of lethal mutagenesis has been put forward as a strategy for controlling pathogens. The idea of lethal mutagenesis is to enhance the mutation rate of the pathogen, thereby accelerating mutation accumulation and leading to mutational meltdown and extinction of the pathogen within a specific host individual. The concept of mutation accumulation in RNA viruses has been explored in biological experiments involving bacteriophages, tobacco H virus, polio-virus, vesicular st uh, stomatitis virus, and HIV. So this is sort of mainstream. All these researchers report rapid, rapid fitness declines of viral strains as deleterious mutations accumulate, often leading to the actual extinction of some strains. This strongly contradicts claims that RNA viruses are somehow robust against the accumulation of deleterious mutations. 
Lethal mutagenesis is considered a potential antiviral therapy for infected patients and is also recognized as having relevance to the management of pandemics. RNA viruses, and again, I'm not reading this just straight through because otherwise we would be here for a couple of hours, uh, typically have an extraordinarily high mutation rate. The higher mutation rate of RNA viruses is a consequence of the novel mechanisms required for RNA replication, which are especially prone to mutation, and the lack of effective repair enzymes for RNA replication. So it's a lot harder uh, than it is, uh, it's a lot easier to mutate than it is DNA. Even in RNA viruses with relatively small genomes, there appear to be as many as 0.1 to 1.0 new mutations per virus per replication cycle. And in one case, you will find there's three. The mutation rate in RNA viruses is so high that it becomes difficult to speak of a given viral strain because any genotype quickly mutates into a complex of genotypes such that any patient is soon infected with a viral swarm. With such a high mutation rate, the large majority of viral genotypes in a patient must carry many deleterious mutations and so will be inferior to the original infecting genotype. This implies the lack of a realistic mechanism to preserve a standard genotype, and all viral RNA viral swarms should typically be on the verge of mutational meltdown, or at least heading that way. When a virus is transmitted from one individual to the next, the first individual harbors a viral swarm. The second individual becomes infected by a random subset of that swarm, conceivably a single genotype, with this type of bottlenecking, the best viral genotypes within the first swarm have a small probability of being transmitted to the next host. Given a high mutation rate and regular bottlenecks, the operation of Mueller's ratchet becomes quite certain, which is something that causes degeneration, which should result in a continuous ratchet-like mutational degeneration of the viral <coughs> genome. This type of genetic degeneration happens independently of specific virulence factors. In this light, it appears very likely that RNA viruses should have a strong tendency to undergo what we will call natural genetic attenuation. This should happen within the individual host organism as, a means, as the mean fitness of the viral swarm continues to diminish with every replication cycle. This should happen even more dramatically as the viral swarm undergoes recurrent bottlenecking as it passes from host individual to host individual. Such natural genetic attenuation should logically contribute to the transient nature of RNA viral infections within the individual, as well as the transient nature of pandemics caused by RNA viruses. Now, I'm gonna say I think it's a minor factor in the individual, unless you're taking antivirals. But it is a major factor, as we will see in uh, the extinction of pandemics. And we had a question here. Well, I guess it raises the question why we have RNA viruses at all still. It does, and we'll get into that at the end. Historical evidence that RNA viruses undergo natural genetic attenuation. So this is other people that have researched this. Dengue type 2 virus, a mosquito-borne positive sense single-strand RNA virus caused an epidemic in several Pacific Islands from 1971 to 1974. A recent paper studied the epidemiological, clinical, and biological observations recorded during this time. The authors note that the time period, population dynamics, and isolation of this ed epidemic gives a unique opportunity to study virus evolution minus many confounding factors. The initial outbreak of the disease on Fiji and Tahiti caused severe clinical symptoms, while the final outbreak on Tonga produced mild symptoms and near silent transmission. Sequence and phylogenetic analysis showed that the outbreaks were generally related and all due to single introduction. Also, these analyses placed the Tongan viral isolates in a single clade with some unique side substitutions compared to viral isolates early in the epidemic. It is these deleterious genetic changes that Steele et al. believe was, was responsible for the reduced epidemic severity on Tonga in 1973 and 1974. We are seeing genetic entropy in real 
time. And not only that, but recognizing it. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS. You may have heard of that. And everybody was terrified it was going to go all around the world, right? Caused by an animal-derived coronavirus appeared in the human population of Guangdong Province in China in late 2002. 61 viral isolates from humans were sequenced from the early, middle, and late phases of the outbreak in this region and were compared to the animal-derived viral sequences. This epidemic was characterized by its sudden appearance, its extreme virulence, its rapid spread, and the rapid collapse of the pandemic after just two months. This dramatic collapse cannot reasonably be att attributed to human intervention. Given the SARS in man appeared to have an inordinately high mutation rate of roughly three mutations per replication, and given that this very short-term pandemic, 291 mutations accumulated in the virus, which is not very big, it seems the most reasonable to conclude that the outbreak ended prematurely because the virus underwent mutational degeneration and natural genetic attenuation. Similarly, Ebola outbreaks, now this is written in 2011, so keep that in mind, have emerged explosively, initially being extremely virulent and extremely contagious, but very quickly they became self-contained apart from human intervention. While the Ebola virus appears to have had a, an extremely wide host range, it has been almost impossible to find it in the natural fauna of the relevant regions. This can most reasonably be explained by self-containment of the virus due to high mutation rates and natural genetic attenuation. Bowen et al. cite the World Health Organization's report suggesting that such attenuation occurred after just 10 to 11 passages within the human population. Influenza A virus, and we're going to come back to that, causes respiratory infections in mammals and birds. In humans, this virus causes a yearly epidemic and an occasional pandemic. It appears that influenza strains are continuously going extinct at a high rate. The actual precursor strains of the H1N1 strain that caused the disastrous 1918 pandemic are unknown and can be presumed to be extinct. Notice there's a reference for that. The H1N1 strain itself appears to have gone extinct early in the mid-20th century and apparently was inadvertently reintroduced from a researcher's lab freezer in 1977. During the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, one of two original strains went extinct. Given the global nature of the influenza spread and distribution, it can, be, can very reasonably be asked, why does the previous year's strain of the flu routinely disappear so quickly? Why do most strains of influenza appear to routinely go extinct? The most reasonable answer would seem to be natural genetic attenuation due to mutation accumulation. And uh, this is the paper, and it's, it's doing this on the computer, and then we're going to see some real live stuff later on. Mendel's accountant tracks mutation accumulation over time as affected by the primary relevant variables such as mutation rate, distribution of mutational effects, selection pressure, and population size. Although Mendel has traditionally been used to model higher organisms, for example, diploid sexually active, sexually reproducting species, reproducing species, it has alt alternative parameter settings that allow us to model populations of organisms with small haploid genomes and which reproduce clonally. In these experiments, we model a genetic RNA virus similar to the in influenza virus. Single viral substrain, series of 100 individuals, 300 days uh, that they're following this, viral doubling time of one hour, which means 24 uh, uh, doubles uh, a day, passage to a new host individual every three days, which is about average, uh, transmission of either 10 or 1,000 viral, uh, viable viral particles. Maximal population size of uh, 10,000. The reason they use that is because creating populations larger than this has minimal effect on selection efficiency and mutation accumulation, but it, it swamps the computer. They chose a functional genome size of 10,000 nucleotides, which approximates flu. 10% uh, of all mutations are perfectly neutral, with the remainder of the mutations being 99% deleterious and 1% beneficial. 
and they do allow for back mutations. That is, if it mutates from a good um, genome to a bad genome, it could conceivably go back. And then the well-accepted Weibull distribution for mutation effects, and they have a reference for that. Well, they're beneficial to us because they're deleterious to the, the, uh, the virus. Depends on whose side you're on. Um, our first experiment was a preliminary Mendel run using very conservative parameters. This was designed as a baseline for minimal genetic attenuation of our model RNA virus as would, be, as would occur during a 300-day pandemic. We used a low mutation rate of 0.1 mutations per virus particle per replication cycle. In every replication cycle, the number of viral particles was allowed to double, and we modeled zero random death. Zero percent of the viral particles were randomly lost, which of course wouldn't be true in a real uh, uh, pandemic because uh, antibodies would start picking some of the viruses off. Um, Phenotypic selection was applied, partial truncation, to eliminate all the surplus population such that the initial population size was restored. In this first experiment, we did not model any population bottlenecks. So this is the kind of the ideal. Um, the results of this experiment are summarized in figure one, we, which I'll show you in a minute. We see that even using highly favorable assumptions and intense selection, the simulation failed to prevent mutation accumulation. After 7,200 replication cycles, each virus accumulated an average of 235 deleterious, 74 neutral, and 9.4 beneficial mutations. There were 523 polymorphic, notice a huge more, number more of, of deleterious than beneficial. There were 523 polymorphic mutant alleles seg segregating in the population, meaning that it was a very genetically diverse viral form. Swarm. That means 500 and over 500 different kinds of viruses. Although seven beneficial mutations went to fixation within the swarm, these carried with them 180 deleterious mutations that also went to fixation. So the original was lost from posterity forever. Fitness declined 16% in just 300 days. By the end of the experiment, deleterious mutation count per virus was increasing at an essentially constant rate, and mean viral fitness was declining at nearly constant rate. These results indicate the presence of strong forces working to attenuate any viral strain, even when conditions for maintenance of the virus are optimal. And uh, um, So a replication cycle is how yeah. long in viruses? Now, if you look here, this is capitalized. Uh, if you look here, um, it's not capitalized. The computer just did that. Uh, I'm showing that to you because if you happen to see something up there that doesn't exactly match the book, the computer sometimes auto-corrects, and I don't know why. But So here's the deleterious mu mutations going up. Here's the neutral mutations going up. Here's the favorable mutations going up. Yeah, there are favorable mutations, and they do increase, but not anywhere near as many as the deleterious ones. Now, how deleterious are the deleterious ones? How favorable are the favorable ones? Yeah, but what's happening is while, you, while you're doing all the body work on your car, it's rusting out. And here's what happens to fitness, and you can see it kind of continuously goes down. Now. We then conduct, uh, conducted a series of four simulations wherein we modeled the effects of factors that might accelerate natural genetic attenuation. Figure two summarizes the fitness decline seen in these experiments. In the first of these experiments, we introduced a realistic but modest degree of random loss of viral particles, as might be expected due to chance and various host defense mechanisms. Simultaneously, we introduced a very weak and recurrent bottlenecking of population size um, a thousand viral particle infections, uh, a thousand viruses were chosen randomly out of, the, out of the mass and then allowed to reproduce in the next host. 
corresponding to high inoculum levels during viral transmission to new host individuals. The result of this second experiment was a very slight acceleration in the rate of genetic attenuation compared to figure one. Uh, final mean fitness, uh, fitness was reduced from 0.84 to 0.82. And there's figure two, and you can see that's the black line. This is the 0.25 in the 1,000. Now, what they don't show you on this slide is what the other one is, so I went and overlaid it, and you can see they're almost the same. This, this is the original one that you saw. Okay. The red one is original. In the second simulation, we tested the effect of increasing the random loss of viral particles as might arise from, for example, due to host RNA activity or as a result of uh, antiviral pharmaceuticals, or as might arise during the, due to partial immunity within the host. We eliminated 40% of all viral particles by random death, thus reducing the viral surplus population from 50% to 10%. This effectively reduces selection intensity. This, the result was another very slight acceleration of fitness decline. So we're going to 0.79, that's number three here. In the third simulation, we tested the effect of much more severe bottlenecking with just 10 viable viral, viral particles per new infection. This might be clinically achieved by either use of antiviral pharmaceuticals or through better hygiene. Just Flat out washing your hands, and, and so if you do get any viruses, it's a very small inoculum. We see that where we have strong bottlenecking, selection is significantly less effective and genetic attenuation is much faster. Fitness declined 45% in 300 days. Final mean fitness 0.55. After 7,200 replication cycles, each virus accumulated an average of 350, 356 Deleterious, is 77 neutral and 9.9 .9 beneficial mutations. So we're getting more mutations. There were only 81 segregating polymorphic uh, alleles instead of the over 500 that we saw before, reflecting the homogeni homogenizing effect of recurrent bottlenecking. Although nine beneficial mutations went to fixations, along with them went 338 deleterious mutations. And that is this line here. And then next, we're going to do both this one and that one, uh, pardon me, and this one. And uh, in the fourth of these simulations, we model intensified bottlenecking combined with 40% random loss. The result was dramatically accelerated fitness decline. Final mean fitness was 0 0.35. And uh, as, as evident from figure two, more severe bottlenecking and higher rates of random loss combine synergistically to greatly accelerate both fitness decline and genetic attenuation. And that's the fourth line here. And you'll notice that it's not addition of number two and three, but it's almost like it's a multiplication. So, so replication cycles occur how frequently? How long does it take? Well, in this We're particular case, minutes. they're assuming every hour. Every hour, okay. We lastly conducted a series of four simulations wherein we examined the consequences of increasing mutation rate as might be achieved by using a pharmaceutical such as ribavirin. We used the most conservative setting shown in figure two, weak bottlenecking and only a moderate uh, rate of random loss, so the top line that's almost with where the red line was. Okay, and we then examined the effects of increasing mutation rate from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, or 0 0.8. The fitness decline resulting from an elevated mutation rate is shown in figure three. And I'm going to add the original one, and you can imagine the other one coming down just below it so that you can see where we're, what we're looking at. Uh, remember the, uh, the, so, we're looking at 0 0.84 to 0 0.82, and now these ones are actually heading down to extinction. As can be seen, even modest changes in the viral mutation rate had a substantial effect on viral fitness decline. A mutation rate of 0.2 resulted in a final mean fitness of 0.57 as opposed to a final fitness of 0.82 when the mutation rate was 0.1. 
A mutation rate of 0.4 caused strain e extinction after 5,743 replications or 239 days into the pandemic. If you go to 0.6, you get 2,224 replications or 93 days, and 0 0.8, 1,003 replications or 42 days. Discussion. Numerical simulations support our thesis that RNA virus should be subject to natural genetic attenuation through mutation accumulation. We saw that even slight increases in the mutation rate had a profound effect on the rate of genetic attenuation. This is consistent with Domingo et al., who claim that even a 25-fold increase in mutation rate is sufficient to cause loss of infectivity of both polioviruses and vesicular stomatitis virus. Such elevation mutation rates can be readily be achieved using certain pharmaceuticals. There is hope. We believe there is strong theoretical evidence that RNA viruses should systematically undergo natural attenuation, which is now supported by our numerical simulations. This raises the obvious question. If this is true, why have not all vi RNA viruses gone extinct? I think that was your question. Um, the most likely explanation seems to be that such viruses are preserved in natural reservoirs where they are more stable. The most obvious way for an RNA virus to be more genetically stable is to be in an environment where they have a slower replication and higher fidelity RNA replication. Conclusions. Our findings are consistent with the idea that there are already very high rates of natural extinction among RNA virus, viral strains and that the vast majority of RNA viral strains die out naturally due to mutation accumulation. Such mutational degeneration should play a significant role in the natural progression of pandemics, with mutation accumulation causing the natural genetic attenuation of any given RNA viral strain. Our numerical simulations strongly indicate that such natural genetic attenuation can be enhanced during pandemics by A, employing strategic use of antiviral pharmaceuticals that increase RNA mutagenesis, B, increasing genetic bottlenecking by in, in reducing inoculum levels through improved hygiene and other means, and C, strategic use of broad spectrum vaccines that produce partial immunity and other means for reducing viral titers. Now, they have an addendum because this was published two years after the original paper. Since this study was purely theoretical based on biologically reasonably re realistic numerical simulations, after this chapter was already accepted and finalized, an empirical analysis was in initiated of actual mutation accumulation within the H1N1 influenza viral genome since 1918. Those of you who were here a few years ago when Stanford was here may remember him talking about this new study. Um, Within the human lineage, nearly every H1N1 strain that arose very quickly became extinct. All circulating human H1N1 strains went extinct in the mid-1950s, but the human H1N1 lineage was reseeded into the human population in 1976, apparently from a researcher's freezer. Do we have his name? <laughs> <laughs> they have left him anonymous. <clears throat> the human lineage apparently went... Um, again went extinct in 2009. During the entire history of H1N1 within man, mutations accumulated in a perfectly linear fashion, exactly as seen in this theoretical study. In the course of 90 years, almost 15% of the viral gene, genome mutated, al always at a very constant rate. Viral fitness, as, as reflected by associated human mortality rates, declined continuously and systematically from 1918 all the way to the apparent extinction of the human H1N1 strain in 2009. Because the publication of these proceedings was significantly delayed, the empirical study was published before the present theoretical study, which spawned the empirical study. Now, uh, I've omitted the actual reference because I'm going to move right there. Theoretical Biology and Medical Modeling, 2012, and it is available on the internet in case you want it. New look at an old virus. Patterns of mutation accumulation in the human H1N1 influenza virus since 1918. By the way, this is in the peer-reviewed literature. Anyway, here is the abstract. 
Now, this abstract is separated in, uh, into categories. Uh, some of you uh, will have run into that kind of abstract. The H1N1 influenza A virus has been circulating in the human population for over 95 years, first manifesting itself in the pandemic of 1917-1918. Initial mortality was extremely high, but dropped exponentially over time. Influenza viruses have high mutation rates, and H1N1 has undergone significant genetic changes since 1918. The exact nature of H1N1 mutation accumulation over time has not been fully explored. Methods, we've made a comprehensive historical analysis of mutational changes within H1N1 by examining over 4,100 fully sequenced H1N1 genomes. This has allowed us to examine the genetic changes arising within H1N1 from 1918 to the present. Results, we document multiple extinction events, including the previously known extinction of human H1N1 lineage in 1950s and an apparent second extinction of the human H1N1 lineage in 2009. These extinctions appear to be due to continuous accumulation of mutations. At the time of its disappearance in 2009, the human H1N1 lineage had accumulated over 1,400 point mutations, more than 10% of the genome. Massive mutations. Including approximately 330 non-synonymous changes. That means it not only produced a different RNA, it produced different proteins. The accumulation of both point mutations and non-synonymous amino acid changes occurred at a constant rate, mu equals 14.4 and 2.4 new mutations per year respectively, and mutations accumulated uniformly across the entire influenza genome. We observed a continuous erosion over time of codon specificity in H1N1, including a shift away from host, human, swine, bird, duck, codon preference patterns, which are better for the virus because there's more of the trans, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the tRNA, th is it the, uh, the one that, the one that uh, carries the amino acid to match. Conclusions, while there have been numerous adaptations within the H1N1 genome, most of the genetic changes we document here appear to be non-adaptive, and much of the change appears to be degenerative. We suggest H1N1 has been undergoing natural genetic attenuation and that significant attenuation may even occur during a single pandemic. This process may play a role in natural pandemic sensation and has apparently contributed to the exponential decline in mortality rates over time as seen in all major human influenza strains. These findings may be relevant to the development of strategies for managing influenza pandemics and strain evolution. Imagine getting this into the peer-reviewed literature. At the close of World War I, the H1N1 influenza vi A virus swept the world. During the 1917-18 pandemic, approximately 40% of the human population was infec inf infected. That's just incredible, with a death rate above 2%. It is estimated that this virus killed more people than died in the world war that was just ending. Interestingly, it tended to kill the healthy instead of the weak and the young and the old, you know, the people who are kind of on the margins. Uh, mortality rates have dramatically declined since then, but the H1N1 flu has persisted. As a zoonotic pathogen, the influenza virus is able to infect multiple species. It is generally thought that aquatic waterfowl are a primary natural influenza reservoir, where there are usually no clinical symptoms and where a low-level transmission probably perpetuates the viral pool. All 14 influenza subtypes are maintained in waterfowl, ducks to be specific. H1N1 has had an interesting history. Derivatives of the original virus circulated in humans and swine until 1957 when the human strain went extinct. In 1977, a version identical to those circulating in Northeast Europe in the early 1950s reappeared in Anshan, China. So whoever the, victim, uh, the villain was, it was Chinese. Um, and subsequently spread across the world. In 2009, a swine H1N1 jumped to the human population, causing a widespread pandemic. 
This has increased concern that H1N1 might be may mutate into more virulent form. However, since the pandemic of 1917, this has not happened. It is therefore reasonable to ask if the striking reduction in H1N1 mortality might be due in part to natural attenuation resulting from deleterious mutation accumulation. The literature suggests RNA viruses should be inherently subject to mutational degeneration, and uh, we've seen this list before. And I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff. Uh, methods, accession numbers for all available complete flu genomes were obtained from the influenza research database as of June 1, 2012. This list was then compared with those available at flugenome.org. And um, again, a bunch of technical stuff. Um, you can read it on the internet if you need to. Uh, results during the 2009 to 2010 H1N1 outbreak, mutations within H1N1 accumulated at a relatively constant rate, and we're going to see figure one. The strain sequence at the end of the pandemic had approximately 80 more mutations than the 2009 reference genotype. Given that the data were collected from viral strains circulating worldwide, the correlation between mutation count and the date of collection was surprisingly good. And How's that for a straight line? Mm, if, I, if I had data like that, I'd be pretty proud. Now, by the way, you notice how many hundred data points there are. You're going to see this reappear in the next slide as a very small portion. So you can see there's a lot more data than what shows up. Um, now interestingly, this data point here is the zero point, and yet it looks like it doesn't go to zero, which means that there's probably um, a range of, 20, uh, of 40 plus mutations between different strains of uh, swine flu just by itself um, that allowed this to, uh, that allowed the, our zero point to be off from the uh, from the slope of the curve. And you see that circled stuff? That was all that stuff we just looked at. So you can see how compressed the, this stuff is. And now you can see a, a very nice straight line that includes that. And then suddenly, right here, there's, it starts again and goes right back up. It just shifted. This, this is the one that came out of the refrigerator. Uh, or was it about 20 years? About 20 years. <laughs> the linear accumulation of mutations during the 2009 outbreak clearly also extends to the longer term accumulation of mutations during the entire history of H1N1. During the last century, there's been a remarkably constant increase in mutation count within the H1N1 virus population, except for a striking discontinuity between 1957 and 1976. This continuity re reflects the extinction of the human H1N1 strain in the mid-1950s, followed by the reintroduction of the strain in 1976, presumably from a researcher's freezer. Even though most reports, for example, uh, one reference, indicate the reintroduction year was 1977. Our data suggests that the year for reintroduction was 1976. This is based upon the Isolate A, New Jersey, 1976, which clear, very clearly falls in line with the rest of the reintroduced lineage. So notice that after reintroduction in 1976, the human H1N1 mutation count and the rate of accumulations resumed exactly where it left off just before the extinction occurred in the 1950s. Now, our data clearly shows that some non-frozen H1N1 genotypes occasionally appeared in the human population after H1N1 dropped from public concern after 1957. Nine H1N1 strains that do not belong to the frozen lineage arose in the human population between 1976 and the 2009 H1N1 outbreak, Those, the ones that are kind of dotted along there. These nine strains appear to represent repeated transmission events from pigs to humans that failed to cause any pandemic. The porcine lineage had no extinction event, and hence no pause in mutation accumulation. 
nearest neighbor calculations, data not shown, but the, by the way, this is one of the things I asked him to do when we were reviewing this data. Indicate these strains are not a continuation of the human lineage. In other words, although they're, they're coning away from the original, they're coning away in a, actually a different direction. If you wanted, to, it's, it's more of a cone than it is a, a, uh, a straight line. They cluster tightly with the 2009-2010 outbreak porcine viruses. Kedwai et al. affirmed earlier conclusions that the 2009 genome was due to a reassortment between two swine viruses, an H1N2 and an H1N1, from different continents, but this did not affect the mutation accumulation curves. They just keep degenerating. When we shifted the frozen samples back 21 years, that is, sequences from 1976 were assigned to recalibrate a date of 1955, and all the other ones were moved. We see the data lines up almost perfectly. R equals 0.989. Mutation rate is 14.4. The accumulation of non-synonymous mutations in human H1N1 genomes is also shown in figure three. The non-synonymous mutations are not as abundant as expected, but they are still accumulating at a rapid and constant rate. And there is what happens if you take those 1976 things and move them ahead 21 years. Pretty straight line. Notice that they're accumulating mutations. Interesting, you project this back and then try to uh, see where it, it uh, gets down to zero. The data in figure three can be used to estimate the time of arrival into the human population of the first H1N1 virus. Extrapolating total mutation count linearly backwards to zero yields a year of first introduction into the human population of approximately 1893. Interestingly, this would be in time to explain the 1889 to 1890 Russian flu outbreak, which has been considered by some to possibly be the first H1N1 outbreak. No sequence or serotype data are available for that event. Our data strongly confirmed that all human H1N1 viruses derive from a single, very recent common ancestor, just as others have concluded prior to the study. Before its apparent extinction in 2009, the human H1N1 li lineage had accumulated approximately 1,400 mutations, mostly point mutations, including 320 non-synonymous mutations compared to the 1918 genotype. Discussion. It has been generally assumed that any non-neutral mutations within the influenza genome have arisen as selective adaptations and generally help drive influenza towards a stronger and more dangerous pathogen in terms of either pathogenicity or transmissibility, although there's some people that argue it should be just transmissibility. This is probably the basis for the extreme caution exhibited during the 2009-2010 H1N1 outbreak. Everybody is terrified. There was, well, not everybody, but a lot of people were. There's a general perception that given enough time, H1N1 might mutate into a stronger pathogen and hence might create another catastrophic pandemic as it did in 1918. Despite this common perception, a more lethal version of H1N1 has not arisen in mutation within the human population during the past 90 plus years. This is significant. It is true that the population had a degree of residual immunity and was not as immunologically naive as it was in 1917-18, but selection has still not been able to generate a devastating pandemic from the remnants of that which swept the world at the close of World War I. And uh, skipping on relevance and potential objections, Simonson et al. showed mortality statistics for three influenza strains over multiple years H1N1 from 1918 to 1987, H2N2 from 1958 to 1962, and H3N3 from 1968 to 1995. That, um, so he was looking at mortality. There has clearly been a continuous exponential decline in influenza-related mortality over time, and this is true for all three major serotypes. Reduction in mortality may be due to many other factors, including herd immunity, advances in medicine, advances in hygiene. But would these other factors be expected to follow so tightly the time courses seen in Simonson? 
Finally, since we have seen an obvious decay in codon bias, uh, trying, trying to match the human, for example, in either human, duck, or pig, it is clear that H1N1 is not evolving towards optimal codon usage in any of these species, but is slowly drifting away from optimal translational efficiency. We concur with Alan et al. that the issue of codon usage seems to be much more important, at least for influenza viruses, than previously thought. Could H1N1 ever back mutate into a strain such as the ancestral genotype that caused the catastrophic 1917 to 1918 pandemic? Given that the modern strains of H1N1 have diverged from the original 1918 strain by nearly 2,000 mutations, that many of these mutations should be slightly deleterious, and that natural selection was unable to stop their, accumulus, uh, their continuous accumulation in the first place, it is difficult to imagine how mutation selection might ever restore full virulence. It's gone. It is often thought that a high mutation rate translates to rapid adaptation and evolution, yet the reverse seems to be more commonly true. Deleterious mutations often interfere with selection for the, mer for the r more rare beneficial mutations. <coughs> Conclusions. And this is our last paragraph. It appears that the H1N1 strain currently in circulation are significantly attenuated and cannot reasonably be expected to back mutate into a non-attenuated strain. The greatest influenza threat, therefore, is the, re is the introduction of a non-attenuated strain from some natural reservoir. This suggests that a better understanding of the origin of such non-attenuated strains should be a priority. Our findings suggest that new strategies that accelerate natural genetic attenuation of RNA viruses may prove useful for managing future pandemics and perhaps in the long run, precluding the genesis of new influenza strains. Now, my take, I have one minor criticism of the biological information paper, and that is that in the individual host, degeneration is not as important as host resistance factors. And I would have made that pretty clear. I mean, we clean these things up. They don't just fall apart. Falling apart may have a minor role, but it's not a major one. However, that being said, I think viruses should be, and there's good evidence that some of them are, degenerating rapidly. This is contrary to evolutionary expectations. How many of you have heard it's going to evolve into something horrible? Maybe we can help this process by causing mutations, by washing our hands. Viruses if they're degenerating, they appear to be intelligently designed. Maybe Hoyle was right, or at least partly right. Watch out for that flying saucer. Now, this appears to be empirically testable. Specifically, we've got an Ebola uh, epidemic going on. There are some data on the current epidemic Ebola epidemic that seem to fit with this thesis, although they also can fit with other theses. And if you're interested, there's some uh, references to look at. Uh, this is dangerous research. The paper in Nature, five of the 58 researchers died of Ebola, and the, uh, uh, the article was dedicated to them. The molecular clock works for viruses. Might it not work for mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam, and at least mitochondrial Eve is about 6,000 years old. That's the data. Matter of fact, other molecular clocks seem to indicate a short, shorter time sp uh, spans than the standard time scale calls for. And if you're interested in one of those um, in plants, uh, there's a reference to it for you. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, I think we need two points to keep in mind here. Uh, you're dealing with an RNA system. While 
we in general have a editing and correcting system that RNA viruses don't. RNA viruses don't. So uh, you, you must not equate the two. On the other hand, I think you need to keep in mind, if you're going to evolve life from no life, you're swimming upstream and you're going slower than the current. You, the, the equivalent here is pretty, <laughs> pretty obvious that uh, before the editing and correcting system and so on have uh, evolved, how did organisms ever survive? That's, uh, that's another problem. Uh, it's beginning to is look like, um, uh, <clears throat> like the first life was irreducibly complex, shall we say? It, it could not do, I mean, uh, these, these resources are tremendous here. This just, just blocks the whole thing. Uh, unless you have an editing correcting system, you're not going to have survival. Here, these, I mean, these resources are tremendous here. It's incredible. Uh, you're not going to have survival, and uh, I mean, the origin of life is done for. I, I have to agree with you. Um, Ricky, and then... Uh, I was just curious if any of these contributors ever extrapolated this idea of RNA viruses being genetically engineered. I mean, I've, to me, they just, I've long thought that they were engineered. There's no useful value in general. They're, they just look mechanistic to me, you know. And so anyway, that's my private thinking. So I just wondered if, if they've well, ever let any little things slip out of their conversation about extrapolating these uh, RNA viruses back to a point at which they were engineered. Um, Do you know of any? Uh, I, I don't know of any. Um, I, I mean, the, this article t tended to avoid that question, although it does, you know, kind of hint maybe at it in, in places. Uh, the, the, um, the article that made it into the peer-reviewed literature um, avoided that question like the plague. Excuse me. For obvious reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, if you just look at it, you go, you know, how else would it get there? And, and I think that it's fair to say, uh, you know, um, it's an entirely possible that an enemy had done this. Um, I was often wondering um, if natural selection were to be true, to, to be the devil's advocate, wouldn't I expect that organisms that uh, replicate fastest should have the decided advantage? Yes, so flu should have really taken off after 1918. Uh, and bacteria. And multiply much faster than we do. <laughs> right. You know, why right. isn't the world overcome by bacteria, say, than, than the higher organisms? Yeah. Uh, well, it's if, if, if the selective natural, I mean, pressures uh, with chance, the evolutionary method, if that evolutionary method worked, then bacteria should have taken over the planet. Uh, except that they, the viruses would have um, taken over the bacteria. Well, <laughs> <laughs> see the, the, so so we end up down to the lowest common denominator. <laughs> well, that, that's that's the whole story won't hold together. Yes, we. Uh, we multiply slower, but we have better DNA reproducers. But if you calculate how many new mutations we have, we're going down. We're going down too. We just have a slightly different slope, and that's all. Yeah. Well, this is Sanford's idea, right? He says we don't have much time. I don't know what his time scale is, but he's saying that we're going to go extinct eventually. Well, that, that's number one is that the hope for humanity does not regard in, uh, does not live in having kids. Um, 
who have kids who gradually get better and better. No. The hope for humanity is in Jesus Christ. And in fact, he has that in his book, Genetic Entropy, at the end. But he also says, yeah, no, no, you shouldn't just ask about the end. You should ask about the beginning. You know, if you're watching a water beetle swimming upstream at uh, you know, two-tenths of a mile an hour, and the current is going 10 miles an hour under the bridge, there are two things you can say. One of them is the water beetle is not going to save himself from the falls at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the river. That's number one. But number two, you can say the water beetle didn't get there by swimming upstream. Yes. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, did you try extrapolating that curve backwards? That's such a linear relationship that, that it seems like where, where is it going to hit the zero now, we have to be fair because if, you know, if this is the strain that we're comparing it to and it's coming down like this, actually I should do it like that so we're... Oh, I see, that's... Uh, then, yeah. then, if you're, um, then if you extrapolate it back, do you extrapolate it to zero or do you extrapolate it to where this one degenerated from the same spot? Yeah. So you have to be cautious about exactly where it hits. But it definitely hits in the you know early late 1800s. Regardless of which method you use, and that's where the Russian and that was. the Russian thing is after that. Oh. So. Yes. You can't blame the communists then. We, we have a question over here. How would this reappearance of measles fit into this whole story? Um, That's a vaccine thing. Interesting question. Uh, does the measles have some non-human uh, uh, substrate it lives off of? You know, one of the things that you can raise is maybe this is how leprosy disappeared. I mean, biblical leprosy is not, does not have the same symptoms is what we call leprosy today. Hmm. If you read the description, it's not the same. It's just not. Um, and uh, raising the question of whether it was either a much more virulent form of the disease or perhaps an entirely different disease, and maybe it went extinct from uh, uh, attenuation. And maybe these diseases have to be periodically introduced and if they're intelligently designed, maybe some malevolent intelligence has to reintroduce them periodically. So what's the short take home when you're talking to uh, anyone who's recording? Well, OK, there, there's two things. One of them is I think that some subjects I don't bring up unless they bring them up. But if they do. If they say, well, you can't have intelligent, that can't be intelligent design because it's malevolent, you say, no, let's draw the obvious conclusion. There is a malevolent intelligent designer. That means that any religion that has you and God and that's it is false. But, you know, Christianity isn't that way. So I just accept it and move on. And they don't know what to say then. Because they thought they had a perfect killer for our God. No, our God allowed the devil free will. Just like he allows us free will. And if we're going to do nasty things, uh, God's not going to stop us. At least not right away. And the devil wants to do nasty things, God doesn't stop him. At least right away. And so these things, these things do not stop Adventism. If you've got a great controversy, it fits in perfectly. That begs the question about, I thought that Lucifer, I was always taught that Lucifer can't create. So I'm now confused so again. Can't create something from nothing. Well, uh, if, you, if you're going to be that technical, Craig Venter can't create either. But he sure yeah. copied. The... The, the, the human that, decipher the code. that recreated 
DNA from one bacterium and slipped it into another bacterium's. See, so if he can do that, then there's no reason the devil can't do it too. Yeah, he wrote his name in there too. Just, just uh, so, and and uh, in fact, people found his name. Yeah, they found his name before he said he did, and they drew an intelligent design inference. Um, dangerous question, I recognize, but is that how the birth of Lucifer's sin is from this which was set in motion, or was the tree of life supposed to be an antidote? In other words, when we go to heaven, what keeps us alive? Well, obviously we're not, re perhaps obviously we're not reproducing, but perhaps the tree of life has the magic ingredient that reverses the de deterioration. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I think sometimes it's wise for us to say that up front. Um, Uh, it's, you know, but the, the other thing to keep in mind is this data is a killer for trying to explain the influenza virus, the HIV virus, the Ebola virus, all of those viruses, trying to explain them as getting better and better yes. with time. Yes, they don't. It's Which the means that, not one, you're stuck with intelligent design. But two, evolution is not working there where it has its best chance. How in the world are you going to get humans from monkeys in five million years? Uh, yes, and then, okay. Well, I, I, I just want to uh, keep in mind there are all kinds of viruses that don't affect human beings also. And, and you must include those in the picture. That's right. So now the, the work that that is left for us to do is to see uh, if we can substantiate this happening in other systems. Yeah, and, and, and there's some data already there for it. Ebola. It's, it's waiting for somebody to pick it up and look at it from an intelligent design, genetic entropy point of view. Um, uh, there is something else that this raises um, uh, in, in my thinking. And I, I remember when I was a kid, there was a saying in uh, the, the, my native language, which if I translate it, it says uh, this way, uh, deception rapidly rises uh, towards the sky, but truth chases it and quickly catches up. So what that, suggests to me is that uh, false concepts may have a reign for a while, but, uh, but after a while they just peter out simply because they're seen as ineffective at best. <laughs> there is a conceptual mutation rate at work as well. Yeah. Comments up here? Or? I guess we have one over on the corner here. There you go. This, this is all far out, but maybe um, we could calculate how many more mutations it take before man would go extinct, and then um, figure it's still going to be people alive when Christ comes. And, yeah, I didn't when the second coming. You have a coming. maximum. <laughs> you have a maximum date yeah. for the second coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, presumably, it should happen before the extinction sets in. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, there is a verse. There's only 144,000 people. Left. Isn't there? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> isn't there actually a verse that says, "But if the days were not shortened." There would be no one left. Yes, there is. Yes, it does say that. Isn't that? that? <laughs> uh, I think it's in Revelation. If the it's days actually were in, not in Matthew 24. Oh, Matthew? Oh, pardon me. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully next week we'll have some more fun with the book, and uh, uh, and if you guys have interesting data or interesting topics to share. 
let me know. Um, uh, I'll either share them for you or I'll let you share them yourselves if you want to. Um, but uh, I think that we live in exciting times and in times where science and religion kind of look like they may come together very nicely. Um, supporting a theist and particularly I think supporting an Adventist view of things. And uh, uh, so I, I, I'm looking forward to the future.